minister to them, we pray. Oh, God, minister to each one that is in this service tonight. May we feel your presence. Thank you for the, the visitors that we've seen, Lord, many visitors in the last little while. Continue to draw people, Lord, by your spirit, Lord. Minister to us all, we pray, and help us, oh, God, to be strong in the Lord, to be the church that you'd have us to be, Lord. Give us a great revival and a great harvest in this uh, area, we pray. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. Here I am.
hallelujah. Let's everybody lift our hands to the Lord and take a moment. Take a moment, hallelujah, with the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We've come to worship you. We've come to praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, when the music fades in all that strength away. And I simply Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart.
love him tonight. Thank you, Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to
grace to trust you, Lord, more. Word of God, speak. Would you pour down like rain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty, the peace still and all, you're in this place, please let me say a prayer, in your holiness, word of God speak, would you pour down
Bibles, let's open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. My message tonight, when you have it, too good. When you have it, too good. I've heard people say the Lord's been too good to me. It's written in songs. God, you've been too good. I may feel that way at times. God, you've been too good. Amen. He's blessed uh, upon blessing, and that's just the way he is. He's a blessing God. He's good to his children. Amen. In fact, he's good to those that curse his name. Every breath they draw, every paycheck they draw, every good thing in life that they participate in is from the hand of God. Every good gift comes from God. Right. When you have it too good. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now these are the commandments. The statutes and the judgments. Which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. That you might do them in the land. Whether you go to possess it. That thou mightest. Fear the Lord. That word is revere, which is to regard with respect, tinged with awe. That you might respect and awe the Lord, thy God. To keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, thy son's sons, all the days of thy life. And that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Everybody say, he's a blessing God. A blessing God. Amen. Every commandment he gives to us, it's for our benefit, that it may be well with thee. God is really interested in our welfare, isn't he? That you might increase mightily Hallelujah. That you might enjoy the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Everybody knew that was coming up. The Shema, <coughs> six and four, one of the most oft quoted scriptures amongst oneness Pentecostals. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Do you still believe in one God? Amen. 
I do. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Love him with everything that is within you. And I've preached it countless times, and I'll say it again tonight. It bears repeating that God doesn't just want us to love him. He wants us to be in love with him. Amen? And there is a difference. Amen. If you'll be in love with God, you'll love God. But he said, teach them diligently unto thy children. Verse 7, thou shalt talk of them when you sit in thine house, when you walk by the way, when you tuck him in at night, in bed, when you lie down, when you rise up in the morning. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. The Jews would wear a little box on their wrist that would be strapped on there. Like a bunch of shoelaces, it would be strapped on there. They would have a, a little box here. I believe they were called phylacteries, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a little scroll rolled up. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He's one. And they had that reminder. Everything they did and every thought they thought was supposed to be centered on that because they were living in a world that was full of idols. It was all around. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou builtest not. Cities you didn't build. And houses full of good things which you didn't fill. And wells digged which thou digst not. Vineyards and olive trees which you planted not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full. Verse 12, my text. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. When you follow the history of the Jews, it's an amazing story. How God called one man, Abraham, out of an idolatrous country, and he separated from his family and the culture and his livelihood and everything that was secure for him, and followed the voice of God out of that country and traveled some, I think they say 500 miles. That's a lot of journey for a man with sheep and other animals. You know, it's like a mobile, a mobile farm. Can you imagine setting that up all the time? <coughs> Trying to keep those sheep all in and setting up the pens or whatever they had, you know, to keep them all together. It was a mobile farm. You got a stationary farm, that's a lot of work. But here is a man and his family, and they leave uh, Ur of the Chaldees, and they're heading to what we know is a promised land, Israel. And not having all the answers, but just knowing that God was directing him, and he follows by faith, and, and, and Abraham is absolutely faithful to God. We never see him falling off the wagon. He made a few mistakes, but he was faithful to God. He had his relationship with God intact. He loved God. He loved God with all of his heart, his soul, his mind, his strength. And he followed God and he taught his family to do right. They weren't perfect, but, but they were godly. And we see as the generations um, began to multiply the number of the seed of Abraham and they become a great company of people. And you know the story how um, amongst that company of people, there's some, um, there is some problems that arise and they end up going down to Egypt during time of famine and 
and the scripture lets us know that it was actually um, jealousy that arose in the family. And, and I, I, I don't think Abraham was completely innocent because, uh, or not Abraham, but um, Isaac was completely innocent. We're, we're looking at the next generation now, the th second and third generation, because he did show some favoritism. And favoritism is an awful thing when it's in a family. Can you say amen? And uh, down they went. But, you know, the brothers were jealous of, of Joseph. And uh, they sold him into slavery. And for many, many years, he's down there. It's probably, you know, 13 years or so. And eventually he gets put up as second in command of Pharaoh. And, and uh, the seed of Abraham are heading down to Egypt to get some grain. And they end up moving down there and they get really comfortable. They get really comfortable. And after they got comfortable, then there's some problems that start developing. Amen. How many know that it's, we all want to be comfortable, don't we? But God, if, if my comfort keeps me from being where I need to be with you, then are you, are you spiritual enough to say, Lord, take away my comfort? And that's exactly what God did with the seed of Abraham. They became slaves in Egypt. Slaves. They were mistreated. And today there are, there are people of the seed of Abraham, God's chosen people, that don't even believe in God. They don't believe in God. And in our, our day, or some of you, are, you were around when this happened, or close to it, you were born around the time of the Second World War, and that terrible Dictator Hitler rose over Europe. He was planning to take over the world. He wasn't going to stop at Europe. He had his submarines, the German U-boats, off the coast of Black's Harbor. Nighttime, they would have to darken their windows so that the light wouldn't shine and they wouldn't know that there was civilization there. His plan was to take over all the world. And what happened to the Jewish race? There were six million Jews as well as other people that were massacred by Hitler's forces. And some of the Jews today said, I, they can't believe in God because if God would allow that to happen, how could a, how could a loving God allow that to happen? And so... We look at that. This was the same seed of Abraham. Where was God? God's always where God's always been. Amen. He's in his word. He's in the principles of his, of his word. And when, when God first brought the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, it was a shock to their system because they had been in that situation for some 400 years. And so the, the slave mentality was so ingrained in them. And when the Lord brought them out under the hand of Moses, the first generation died off. The second generation went into the land of Canaan under Joshua and Caleb. Somebody say praise the Lord. And the Bible tells us that they went into a land that was, it was awesome. There were fruit trees there. They didn't have to plant. There were gardens. They were able to go and harvest. There were houses filled with good things, furniture and everything. Wells were already prepared, dug. Amen. It was just everything they needed. And some wonder why, why God gave that to them. But you know, God was dealing with the Canaanites in the land and they were, they were wicked beyond comprehension. And for 400 years, God tolerated their idolatry and the worst of it wasn't that they were bowing down to sticks and stones and metal objects, but the worst of it was what they were doing with their own kind. They're sacrificing their own children on the altars, burning them to death for their gods. They were wicked, they were corrupt. Very, very evil. 
And God, for 400 years, he dealt with them and he tried to call them to repentance and they, they resisted the conviction of the Lord and they would not reform. And finally, God judged them and he drove them out of the land. Scripture says he sent hornets after them. He drove them out of the land and that land was given to Israel. And that's, that's like a, that's a kind of a picture, really, of you and I entering into salvation. We're delivered from the slavery of sin. From the dictatorship of Pharaoh. Well, our Pharaoh was Satan himself. And God brings us into the church. God brings us into the promised land. And yes, there are battles to be fought in the promised land. And you need to exercise faith. But there's so many good things that we inherit in the family of God. Wells that are dig that you didn't dig. And houses full of good things. And all the trees and vineyards. That you haven't planted in a land of a land of plenty, a land of uh, flowing with milk and honey. And God said, when you when you enter into that, be careful, beware, lest you forget the Lord which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. Beware lest you ever get to the place where you become ungrateful. And you know, that's exactly what happened. The people, at first they were excited. At first they couldn't get enough of all that God had done for them. And they were grateful and they were praising God. And then over a period of time, their heels were cooled. And they kind of got used to the goodness of God, the blessing of God. You know that you can get used to your salvation. I pray to God that I don't ever get used to the fact that God saved me. I pray that God will help me to always appreciate what he has done. His awesome grace. I think God is so gracious that we, there is a danger, always a danger, something that is free that we take it for granted. But just because grace is free does not mean it isn't expensive. Grace did not cost me anything, but it cost Jesus everything. Say amen. It put him on a cross. And we owe God our very lives because he rescued us. He redeemed us from the slavery of sin, just like the Israelites in Egypt. Amen. But the relationship with God began to sour because the people took God for granted. Ungratefulness is the greatest hindrance to relationship. Now you all know if you've been, most of us here tonight, as we know our children were here this morning, but we're pretty much all in or have been in relationships. And we all know a little bit about relationships. We could probably write a book, all of us together, about what we've learned about relationships. Uh, but relationships, they give us an opportunity to grow as an individual. They really do. And it's important amidst the blessings of God, whether that's the blessings of seeing God move like he did last Sunday night. What an awesome anointing. I don't expect that to be tonight. God's dealing with us in a different way. But last Sunday night, the glory of God's power was in this house. If you were here and you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to pray through. It was here. And if you have forgotten what it felt or never took advantage of what God, I didn't say take for granted, but take advantage, amen. He does want you to take advantage of it. Um, if you weren't taking advantage of God's presence and God's glory, then is, is it possible that there could be some ungratefulness in you or I tonight? I'll point the finger at myself as well. Because I'm not beyond the point. As much as I have experienced the blessing on, of God on my life, on my ministry and see miracles literally numerous times and have felt the power of God's anointing and have been used of God and just honored, honored to be touched 
and to have God flow through me. Uh, it doesn't matter how great the touch of God on your life, you and I always have to beware lest we become ungrateful. Right. It's the same thing in a marriage. You could be married to the sweetest gal, or you could be married to the greatest man in this world. And I don't care how awesome you are, uh, situation you find yourself in, it is still possible to get used to and become I'm looking for a word the word is coming to my mind is stupid, but I should use that one <laughs> but how many know what I'm trying to say, we can get used to God. You could be sitting here tonight in the midst of a miracle. You are a miracle. What you're experiencing right now is a miracle. I know there's miracles here tonight. You could have received an awesome healing from God. And it can get old. It's hard to believe that. I just thought about it this past week. That when I was speaking in tongues and praising God, God spoke to me and he said, that's a miracle. That is a miracle. You're experiencing a miracle. You pray in tongues like somebody talks to the cashier and so it's, it's just so natural to be supernatural, to experience the presence and the anointing of God. It blew your socks off once, once upon a time. To know that the mighty God had taken up residence in your soul. But tonight, you could be sitting in the seat of the ungrateful. How on earth does it happen? How is it possible that we can take such things for granted? Israel did it and the church does it. And tonight, pastors do it. And Sunday school teachers do it. And recipients of mighty works of God and miracles in our congregation have gotten used to the goodness of God. I hope the goodness of God is something that always just strikes a, a note of reverence in my heart that I don't ever get used to it, get comfortable, just nonchalant about the goodness of God. Goodness. How could I become so selfish as to not give God thanks today with a heart that is overflowing for all his goodness to me? And you, you, you're in the same position. How could you not? You know, every breath you breathe. I, I think of a friend of mine who died of, 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 of cancer in his throat. And it, it was a tumor and... Uh, and he loved that song, as long as I have breath. Lord, I promise this, that I will always worship you. And that song was sung at his funeral. And even, even when he was taking his chemo treatments and um, to shrink that so that it wouldn't cut off his oxygen, that, that was his song. If he had the breath, he was going to give it to God. And I, I look at this, but this man had a, he had a relationship with God. He prayed right up to the end. And I, I remember, I remember this man, he kept it fresh. He did. And I remember praying, knowing that with my schedule, just for me to be able to get to see him before he died, I said, Lord, please, please, Lord. I, we had to be in his church singing with a group and I said Lord please just don't let him hold on for two more weeks I really felt God had talked to me and he told me I'm, I'm not going to heal him I'm going to take him 
But, you know, you say, well, why wouldn't God, why wouldn't God just heal of this powerful prayer warrior, this powerful encourager? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't God keep him around? We need people like that. We need like a hundred of them, really, in the church today. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't God do it? I don't have the answer, but God knows what he's doing. But God had spoken to me and he said, I'm not going to heal him. I'm going to take him. But he'd already given him nine or ten extra years because he should have died with something else. And in a, a fluke medical thing, they were checking him for something else that ran in his family. They discovered, they discovered a tumor a cancerous tumor on one of his kidneys. We weren't even examining him for that, and they ended up removing that kidney. And I remember he told me, he said, if you ever, he said, um, you're in a position where you have to maybe donate a kidney to somebody, he said, make sure you really love them. Because he said, it hurts. <laughs> make sure you really love them before you donate your kidney. That was his way of saying it hurt to have that surgery and have that tumor, that cancerous uh, kidney removed. But the Lord, true to his word, we arrived and I went to visit him and I, I uh, talked to him and I told him, I said, the Lord is going to take you. I said, the Lord has told me he's not going to heal you. But the prayers you have prayed, he's going to answer those prayers. You can just leave this, your work is done. And left his house, went into service. Um, and it would have been probably no more than two hours later. Got the call. The assistant pastor who was sitting beside him, I believe, in service, or he came up to me and he said, He's gone to be with the Lord. He's gone to be with the Lord. But he kept that, he kept that freshness. Because he prayed and he had relationship with the Lord. Oh. I'm not telling you that the blessings of God are going to make you backslide. I'm just telling you that the blessings of God better make you pray. They better make you pray. They better make you get close to God. Because if you and I don't watch it. As God blesses, and how many know that God's going to bless? I want to hear a big amen. amen. God's going to bless his children. He's a blessing God. Praise the Lord. It may not be in your time frame or mine. or may not be as fast as what you think. But God's going to give us what we can handle. And God's going to bless us. He's going to watch how we respond to his blessings. You know, every time a visitor comes to church, that's a blessing from God. That's an answered prayer. Hallelujah. We're heading in the right direction. Amen. And God's going to save. God's going to deliver people. He's going to do great things. But you and I have got to make up our mind that as God begins to move in our midst, that we make sure that we don't ever get used to it. Right. Don't get used to it those services. It's not going to happen every Sunday night like it did last Sunday night. But if we'll keep on praying and keep on fasting and we'll keep on declaring the word of the Lord over our town, even if it may seem like it's a graveyard of dry bones. Speak the word of God. Speak the word of God like Ezekiel did. Prophesy to the dry bones. Live and hear the word of the Lord. God spirit will move and there shall come a shaking from the Lord and bones will come together bone to his bone amen God will put the body back together he'll put it together the way he wants it and he'll raise it up as an army amen hallelujah and as God does it we better instead of having our little analytical view look as well Let's see if they come back. You ought to be thanking and praising God for every little indication of the move of God. For Elijah, as he prayed with his servant, he sent him out seven times looking for a sign 
from God. And, and when he came back, he said, all I see is a cloud the size of a man's hand. It just looked like a fist out there amidst the totally blue sky. It did not look like the dark clouds that were starting to hover in the heavens over, over here when we first came to church. There was a few raindrops we, we encountered. And I said, we better put the windows up. You never know. It might not last long, but it may come down here. It did not take uh, dark clouds. All it took was a fluffy little white cotton candy cloud up there. And he said, you better get ready. There's a sound of abundance of rain. Head on back to your palace, Ahab. And Elijah outran him in the passion and the zeal of the Lord. And they barely got back in time because of the rains that came. And every little sign that God gives it, he's working in your life. Every little coincidence, quote unquote, I'm saying that very casually here tonight. But every little coincidence that happens in your life when things come together in some way, uh, you better give God some praise and some thanks for him working. Amen. Because it's like one person said, before I started praying and serving the Lord, I never saw these things. But ever since I have, all these coincidences keep happening. How many know it's not a coincidence? It is the hand of God. And we see the will of God unfolding. And I believe that when God begins to respond to us and answer prayers, that we need to give thanks to the Lord. And we need to draw closer to God. And we need to say, God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for what you are doing. Amen? And I believe that God watches how we respond. And the more we respond, the more he will move. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee. I remember when. He said, The kindness of thy youth. I remember you. Jerusalem was like a young lady. His Date, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, that's their engagement. When you went after me in the wilderness, now the children of Israel looked back and they said, well, that was an awful time going into the wilderness. But God says, when I brought you out of Egypt and took you through the wilderness, I think about as that as, as our engagement. He said, I think about that as our love relationship. He said, and brought you into a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. And the first fruits of his increase. Amen. God looked upon Israel as a holy people. God looked upon his bride as, as a pure and spotless bride. He said, I remember how kind you were to me when we were young. I remember how the love that we had when we were engaged. Before we even got married. How we loved each other. We loved spending time with one another. Amen. Do you love spending time with Jesus tonight? If you don't, you better beware. Do you love, love, love spending time in his word and learning more about God? In China, they do. In these communist countries, in these Muslim countries like Iran, where the church is growing exponentially, it's growing in China, it's growing in Iran, because the people are so in love with God. And you and I were once in love with God. I hope we are tonight, but God laid this message on my heart for a reason, and I can't think that, that, that it's just a, co a coincidence, but it's the divine uh, orchestration of the Spirit of God. God is saying, you better be wet. You better be on fire. You better be in love with me like you were when we were engaged when we were back in the dating years. You remember how you acted? You remember how you felt? You say, it's impossible to feel the same way. No, it isn't. If you'll do what you used to do, you'll feel what you used to feel. Amen. That's why it's important in a relationship that we do things together. And I believe that dating should not just be premarital, but it ought to be, it ought to continue in marriage that we do things together. 
and that our relationship continue to flourish. And it's a direct parallel with God. God says, I remember the engagement. I remember the dating years. I remember when, when you weren't sure, but uh, we, were, we were an item. And then I remember when you were sure and we became engaged. And I remember the relationship. And uh, when thou wentest after me, uh, God says, when you pursued me. Now, God can pursue us. He pursued Adam when Adam was backslid. But how many know that it's so much better that you and I pursue God than have God pursue us? When God pursues us, it's usually because we're in trouble. The shepherd left the 90 and 9 and pursued after the lost sheep. The Bible says, draw me and we will run after thee. That ought to be the, the word from the heart of the church tonight. Draw me, Lord. I'll run after you. We ought to be pursuing God and going after God. And, amen. Chasing the Lord. Amen. Chasing revival. Chasing after the moving of God, chasing God. Oh God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a sacrifice today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this up. I'm gonna give that up, uh, Lord, because I'm gonna take some time. I'm gonna pray. I'm going to wait on you. If the devil, if the devil, he's so crafty, but his, his, his most successful thing is to keep us from praying in the church. If he can get us to a place where we don't realize how powerful, how supernatural prayer really is. God begins to move. I believe that when you pray in faith, God is talking to that person's heart that you are praying for. You might not see the evidence because it's in their heart. But I guarantee you that the Spirit of God knows how to convict. The Spirit of God knows how to draw. And when you begin to pray, when we begin to pray for our community, it's just not an accident when people start coming in. The Spirit of the Lord is drawing them. Jesus said no man can come to the Father except the Spirit drawing this Holy Ghost. It's got to draw them like He drew you. Amen. And as we pray, we pray and we release the power of God. How many know that the Spirit of God is drawing tonight? Yes, He is. But the same Spirit that draws them out there is the same Spirit that moves upon us to worship. Hallelujah. So we want God to move out there. We need to worship in here with all of our heart. Now, I don't know how you act, but I know how I act when I'm Worshiping God with all my heart. And you don't have to be me and I don't have to be you. But we better do what we do with all of our heart. Amen. And I can tell you the most obvious sign that somebody is in contact with God. And, and on fire for God is the countenance of their face. And I've seen some dear old seniors whose bodies were full of arthritis. But you could see the peace of God, the glory of God on their face. And they might not be able to jump up and down and move around as some of us that are younger can do. But you can see by the countenance of their face that they are plugged into God. And I'm telling you, there ought to be evidence. There ought to be evidence that you are pursuing God. There ought to be evidence in your life that you haven't taken God for granted. There's no nation been more blessed than the nation of Israel. Now they have experienced things in their history. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He rolled the curtain of time back. He knew that as they were mocking him and, and he was, they were following him on the way to Golgotha's hill where he was going to be nailed on that cross and lifted up for the sins of all mankind. That was for them as well as it was for the Gentiles. But Jesus knew that the majority of his own, he came to his own and his own received him not. But to them that received him, he gave power to become the sons of God. And for the most part, it was the Romans. It was the, it was the Gentiles that got saved and received him. And the blessing of God that was upon the nation of Israel. That blessing and that protection. God wanted to protect them. Jesus said, I want to protect you. How often would I have gathered you as, as, a, as a, a hen would gather her chicks under her wings. But you would not. You rejected. You pushed me away. 
And to this day, it's so sad as we look upon God's people and we see what happened and don't think that we are exempt. Don't think because we're in the body of Christ. The Bible says you have been grafted into the vine. You and I are Gentiles. We don't belong in the commonwealth of Israel. We don't belong in the plan of God. But God, because of the rejection of, of, of the Jews, God removed those branches and God engrafted us. The wild olive, God engrafted us into the tree. Hallelujah. Can you say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. And God has brought us in and he said, don't boast against the tree. Don't say, you know, we're better than we are not better than we're all on equal footing before God Almighty, the judge of the universe. Amen. If we take God for granted as his natural people did, then we will see the results happen to us that happen to them. But if we will love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, God is the God that will bless us. But make sure the blessings bring you closer to the blessing. The blesser. Don't ever replace the blesser with the blessings. Don't ever let the blessings mean more to you than the blesser. I'm preaching to myself. I'm fired up tonight because I see how easy it is. It's easier. In fact, the more God blesses us, as attendance rises, and as God blesses us in every way, God blesses us with, uh, with more uh, manpower, woman power. God blesses us here with, uh, with uh, more finance to be able to do the things that we need to do. And I know that God is. I've seen him do it. If you're doing things God's way, he's going to bless in all those ways. But the only danger comes in is that we could begin to coast. And I don't want to coast. I want to be closer to God today than I was yesterday. And a year from now, I don't ever want to say, oh, well, look what we did. Look what we did. It's not what we do. It's what God does through us. Amen. The blessings of the Lord. Amen. I pray for every church in this area. I name them. I name Hatfield Point. I name Hampton. I name here. I name, uh, slipping my mind, Brother Fenwickville. Yeah. <laughs> don't tell. Petticoat, yeah. Amen. Salisbury, I pray for these churches. I pray for Mission Point. I pray that God will pour out His power. I pray that God will bless. I pray that God will bless those that are here. I pray that God will bless those that left. I pray that God blesses all of the churches around this area, all the believers around this area. Because I believe that the tide that lifts one boat lifts all the boats in the harbor. And I, and I know that God is a blessing God. If we can just get our eyes off of ourselves and get our eyes onto the Lord and make Him the center Hallelujah. And follow after him. And love him with all of our hearts. Oh, pastor, you're not in a teaching mode tonight. You noticed. There's a fire in my soul. And I'd like to light a fire under the seat of somebody's pants. Who's just coasting spiritually. And you know that you could be, you know that you could be more for God. You know that God is, is, a, is wanting to use you. And amen. If you'll pay the price. Listen, pay the price. We only have a short time between now and the rapture. We are so close to this world being taken over by a spirit of communism. There's a spirit of censorship in the land. It's, 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 it's heavy here in Canada. It's in the United States. It's in Europe. It's in Australia. People are being arrested that are the heads of companies that are, uh, that are uh, promoting freedom of speech around the world. And they're being, I read about it tonight. They're making it illegal to say certain things. They're censoring governments that are applying pressure to media. And media is conforming with that. If you're not following the news, then you need to wake up and realize that this is the kind of world. You know that in China tonight, I did not realize this. I thought it was just the Communist Party. There are other political parties. David Curtis lived in David and Debbie Curtis missionaries in Hong Kong and the missionaries in China made this statement just this week on Facebook that in China there were numerous political parties, but the political communist party controls the media. They control the information, and so the people are swayed and made to think what the Communist Party wants them to think and vote according. So if, if the guys of democracy, it's, it's all totally, totally a sham. 
And we're seeing the very same thing happen in Canada and the U.S. And we're seeing it across the European bloc of nations. It's incredible. The people are not ruling. There is an elite group of people. And here we are as the church. And if Satan can silence your prayer life, if Satan can silence your witness, if Satan can cause your faith to be, to be dim, the light of your faith to flicker and to go out, he will do it with, with or without your permission. And you and I have got to have some fire in our souls and rise up against the spirit of the age and say, devil, you're not going to have your way in our church. You're not going to have your way in my life. I'm going to be on fire for God. I'm going to love God more today than I did last week or last year. I'm going to be uh, filled with the zeal of the Lord. And God is raising up some powerful people that have got that mindset. Beware. You would think that with hundreds of prophecies that have been fulfilled in the last five years, that we would be more on fire for God. I mean, 15 years ago, if we had seen one or two of these signs of the end times fulfilled, we would have been so shaken. But the devil has got a watch and he's swinging it in front of your eyes and you're getting sleepy. Very, very sleepy. And we are being lulled to sleep by entertainment and social media and the culture and the spirit of the age. And I'm saying, wake up and make God number one in your life. And get filled with the Holy Ghost. Is this good preaching, Brother Fenwick? Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't just look back and say, well, bless God, 50 years ago, I had my Acts 2.38. You better have your spirit in filling tonight. Before you lay your head on your pillow, you better be talking in tongues and praising God and filled spirit. I'm not trying to put fear in you. I'm trying to put some fire in you and tell you you need to stay alive in Jesus. Amen? Be alive in Jesus. Praise the Lord. The zeal of the Lord. Jesus said, have eaten me up. Amen. I want to lead the way in this church. In worship. In prayer. In my dedication to the word. In my witness. I believe. I don't believe that the saints of God are the witnesses. The preachers just minister to the saints. I believe that preachers need to win the lost. Preachers need to teach Bible studies. Preachers need to be out there. Amen. And we're sowing seed and we're believing that God hallelujah. And you don't always reap where you sow. You will reap places where you never sow. That's the way it is with things that are spiritual. But the important thing is that we are sowing the seed and we are loving people wherever we go. Can you say amen? amen. I don't know if I've got everything out here that I but I, I want to tell you something. Just because grace is free doesn't make it inexpensive. It costs me nothing but costs Jesus everything. And we need, we need to love him. Amen. And I want my relationship with him to be so special. An outstanding young man who I deeply respect who lives in another area of North America. He made this statement to us a little while back. He said, I did not realize how deeply selfish a person I was until I got married. I did not realize, and he was a wonderful, exemplary, holy young man of God. Respectful and dedicated. But he said, I didn't realize until I got married just how selfish a person I was. And I say marriage is a great school of unselfishness. Amen. And if we want to be close to God, then we've got to pray. We've got to pray and say, God, you do what you want with my life. Hallelujah. Can we stand together? Word of God, speak. Would it pour down like rain? Washing my eyes to see.
Amen. See your majesty to be still and know. Hallelujah. How many know God's in this place? God is here. We're not just talking about just a, a casual friendship. God Almighty is in this place. There are certain people that when they're in the house of the Lord, they add something spiritually. They're so on with the Lord. And I miss them when they're not here because they are atmosphere changers. But I believe every one of us can have such a walk with God that when you walk in the room, it's charged spiritually, amen? I want us to come, I want us to pray. I don't want you looking at somebody else and saying, well, they need to get closer to God. Listen, I'm a pastor and I need to get closer to God. Every single one of us. If you can come and find a place of prayer. I think that this word that we've heard tonight is spoken to every one of us. And I, for one, want a closer walk with the Lord. I'm finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay the last thing I need is to be burned but to hear what you would say the word of God Pour down my grave, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness, word of God. When 
express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single Yeah. 